my name is Niels Christoffersen, and it is my duty and pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Meyer Travis from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, of course, he has already introduced himself. Uh, yesterday, I think you all listened to that and are very eager to uh, hear, uh, hear about quality in education today. Um, Professor Travis, you have uh, 40 minutes uh, at your disposal. And uh, after that, it will be time for questioning. Uh, before you start, let me say that it is very reassuring for us educators to hear someone from an institute of technology saying that the school is not a factory and the pupils are no products. Professor Travis. Thank you. I'd like to make one small correction. I am not from MIT. I was there. I left seven or eight years ago. I have also to say that while I was at MIT, became acquainted with the field of quality, I found that within MIT I was a foreign body. And uh, MIT has not been a center for quality activity since I left. <laughs> we have now, on a worldwide basis, had enough experience with quality management principles in industry to know that when carried out properly, they make an enormous difference in how well the enterprise works. We have applied these ideas in government, as well as industry in manufacturing and in service. In fact, uh, I, I am myself surprised to be able to report to you that in January, I shall attend a conference in which 10 law firms, imagine that, lawyers, uh, are going to report on their experience in the application of quality management to improve the way they render service. Um, the lawyers in the United States have a very bad reputation. We have a movie called Jurassic Park, and uh, in it, the dinosaur eats a lawyer, and the people applaud. <laughs> the challenge to move quality management practices from industry to education raises a number of questions. Can we turn the, uh, oh, thank you. We need to remember that the product of the enterprise is the education of the student. And that means that in putting this product together, we must regard the student as the worker who participates in the construction of his or her education. That is a changed paradigm. Um, but, and I want to talk about how uh, this paradigm shift uh, affects what we do in education. Now, I see some of you taking notes. And I want to uh, say what I said yesterday, that I have given uh, Dr. Weiser uh, several papers that I have written. And everything that I'm going to talk about now is in those papers, and you should get them from him. I've given them to him with permission to, uh, to copy them. Uh, when we apply quality management, we begin by asking who is the customer for what we do? And a good way to answer that question is to ask a, a slightly different question, namely, if we didn't do it, who would care? Or if we do it badly, who will care? That defines the customer. Most enterprises, particularly in the free enterprise system or in capitalism, uh, tend to be operated by people who look inward 
the, the customer is uh, someone uh, who's there, uh, you have to have them to do business, but otherwise it would be nice if you didn't have them. What you're really trying to do is to make a lot of money somehow or other, mm -hmm. and you have to deal with customers, but that isn't, that isn't the thing you really want to do. It gets in the way of making money even. Um, but we turn that around and we say the whole purpose of the enterprise is to create more and more satisfied customers. And so in education we have to say, who are our customers? And here we say, who are the customers of this education that is being fashioned? And we can identify four. First of all, there are the students. They are going to have to live with this product for the rest of their lives. Then there are the parents who also have to live with this product. There are future employers who want to use that product for some purpose. And then there is society at large which wishes to have well-educated citizens. That means that when you start to design this product, you have to find out what these different people need. And that leads us to one of our important dilemmas, because if the student, say, in the third grade, is the customer, we recognize that that customer doesn't necessarily know what, 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 it, what is required. So it's important to make a distinction between uh, the contents of an education and the quality with which the contents are delivered. And what we say in our industrial experience is that Customers never really know what they want, but they do know how they want it. Customers can help you to define what it means to do something superbly well. But quite often, you must decide what to offer the customer. Now, in education, that is one of the very big distinctions, because the adults determine what it is that shall be the contents of an education. And we don't always recognize that that, in fact, is a political decision. We know it is a political decision when we go to a country that has a dictatorship, where then they are very strict about what is taught and what is not taught, or where there is a religious domination, as in Iran, so that there are certain things you, you just don't teach, and other things that you must teach. And those are decided by older people, generally very much older people, who want to guarantee that successive generations will think as they do. And what has characterized Western approach to education, I say Western, and I mean um, Western Europe, and America, Canada, uh, we share so many things, and one of them is the notion that we shall free up the next generation to somehow or other deal with the problems we know are coming and for which our own education was inadequate. That's a, one of the premises. And that uh, has a lot to do with the tension that surrounds what shall be included in education. And, and in my lifetime, I'm now in my 73rd year, and in my lifetime I have seen an enormous change in, in what is permitted to be discussed and talked about in schools and what we consider important. Uh, the other day, I met with a group of educators and I asked them what fraction of the students at any moment are in disciplinary action in your schools and they told me practically none. And I have difficulty reconciling that with a, a Nazi march in your city and discussions about crime. Is it true in this country that the children are little angels until just after they graduate and then they get into trouble? <laughs> I found that difficult to, to accept. Um, now the teachers have a new role. In industry we say the people work in a system. The job of the manager is to work on the system to improve it with their help. And that's it. We say the same thing now in the classroom. The teacher is to work on the system to improve it with the help of the students. So teachers and students have new kinds of responsibilities in the classroom. And in order for those responsibilities to be accepted and acted upon, we need to have new kinds of education. For example, in industry, 
if you were working for me, if I am the manager and you are working, doing whatever we do together, I have to teach you how to take data, how to analyze it, how to describe what is going on, so that I can understand and remove the problems with the system that you identify, because only the people who are working in the system can tell what is going wrong. And only the managers have the authority to change. And unless there is this new relationship, we cannot improve the working situation. The difficulty that we have in uh, industry is that people in management think that they belong to a different social class instead of recognizing that they have a unique kind of function. Okay? Management is a function, not a social class. But we have organized the factory so that it has an element of class to it. In, in the factory, the managers wear neckties and the workers don't. They're all special parking place, special blood restaurant. All of those things uh, create a dependence which can be exploited by the people at the top who run the enterprise for their own interests rather than the interests of the enterprise itself and the continuity of the enterprise. And we have something like that in schools too, uh, but it's not as strong. Uh, the, the schools are not as tightly organized most places as industry is, and that's one of the virtues of it. When I was a professor, I, I, I was very pleased with tenure. I, no matter what anybody else said, I could do what I wanted to do. Um, but I, as I said, we have to teach both the teachers and the students new things in order that they can play their role. Now, there are roles that we've seen that teachers and students have, and historically this has been moving from your left to the right. Uh, education, for my parents, was something that teachers did to the student. And the student was a prisoner. Uh, it did as he or she was told, or else. And the attitude of the student was, let me out of here as soon as possible. And in my parents' generation, a large number of people did not finish high school. It didn't matter, there were lots of jobs for them anyway. But education was something the teacher did to the student. Then we became somewhat more enlightened, and teachers, and of course this is, this is not pure, there were always teachers in different, who had different attitudes. Teaching was, education was something you did for the students. Teacher as the leader who knew it, but was doing it for your benefit. And you were pretty ungrateful if you didn't respond. And that could be pretty overwhelming at times, because sometimes you didn't like what was done to you, but it was being done to you. Uh, the psychiatrists have uh, described this, uh, uh, when a mother does this to her child, it's called smother love. Um, and uh, the, the students uh, are passive, silent, they have certain resentment to that, but it's hard to fight back because this person says they're doing it for your own good. And so you look for the easiest way out of the situation. You do minimum work just to try not to make waves, as they say, not to, not to cause troubles. Now, uh, there is a period where the teacher does things with the students. Teacher as sort of fearless leader. Uh, we, we're all in this together, but, uh, you know, I've been there before. I know more than you do, so you follow me, but we're working together. And uh, the, the students like that better. And the characteristic in that class is that after you, the teacher, have given your lecture, you say, are there any questions? And the only question is, will it be on the test? <laughs> 